Shalom. It is good to see you all again, even if I can't see you all, but at least I can see some of you. So I know that there's some people who are here. Today is the, this is the 19th section of, of the Parshas that we've gone through. It's the seventh section in the book of Shemot. And um, I should let you know that uh, this is the beginning of, of the sabbatical month of Adar. Adar has two months marked after it today or this month because of the uh, idea where we have leap day for a leap year every once every four years about every three years they have what they call a leap month and so this is the month of Adar and Adar speaks of strength and it speaks of joy so the joy of the Lord is my strength today so as we're going through this I want to have you look at the at the Parsha section called Teruma. I, I like all things I always change my mind as to what I want to tell you or what I'm going to teach you so there this is nothing new so I decided that I'm going to spend time talking about the chapter 25 and give you some more information I know I'm going to be teaching some of you things that I haven't told you before so hold on to that for Ross, this is all going to be old stuff. He knows it all anyway. So, but just for the rest of you, the guy's a walking encyclopedia of Torah. But anyway, so let's get started. It begins by saying, Hashem spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and let them, this is the unusual part, take for me a portion from every man whose heart motivates him, you shall take my portion. Notice that it doesn't say give, but it says take. And that's an interesting concept. In fact, the, the whole idea that he's speaking to here is the idea of, well, to take for me is, well, if I go back to the beginning, to take for me is the idea of for me, which is the beginning of this sentence. But the idea is take for me for the sanctuary. In other words, help me build the sanctuary. Where were the people getting their money or their goods or whatever they were bringing? They came with them from Egypt. Remember, before they left Egypt, they went to all the homes of the Egyptians and they managed to borrow away everything, which became their salary for all the years of slavery that they had gone through. And so now they now had things. And so God is now asking them to take some of that and give it to him. And by doing that, this, this idea of, of giving it, it is a whole different idea. It's a different mindset. When you take from yourself to give, you are doing just that. You are sacrificing something that you necessarily don't have to because it's voluntary. And that's a significant thing. Giving to God is voluntary. But the reward for that giving far exceeds anything that you ever possibly can give. And so they were giving to God that which they had. Now notice, he goes on to say what he really needs from them, what this offering was to look like. It says that this is the portion that you shall take from the gold, silver, copper, the turquoise, the purple, the scarlet wool, the linen, the goat hair, the red dye, the ram skin, takish skins, acacia wood, oil for the illumination, spices for the ointment oil, and the anointing or the aromatic incense. And then in seven, he says, shohanim stones, or the stones that are going to be on the breastplate for the, for the high priest, and stones for the settings of the ephod. That's going to be on there also. So this whole concept is that they bring items to him. Now, yesterday, when I was sitting there, Sandy gave me a brilliant answer to a question I didn't ask, but she gave me that anyway. As I was going through, I noticed something about what was going on here. If you look at the items that are being given, there's there are 15 of them. Well, 15 is a gematria it's a it's a it's a yud and a hey yud hey is the name of god yah so he's asking for specific things 15 things and yah is the god of this world 
olam haba, this world. And so God is give, asking for 15 things. Now remember, he's the creator of the world. And it only takes one chapter for him to explain all of that. And we just came through the Torah, at Matan Torah, on the mountain. And it only took him three chapters to go through that. But now we're going to spend 12 chapters dealing with this question of giving and what's to be given and how it's going to look when it's all said and done. And so God is, is at this point of, of giving. But the word for terumah, which is the word that we're, we're using here, is oftentimes used for the word to uh, offer or to give. But it also means to lift up or to raise up. And that's the part that Sandy gave to me that just went crazy in my head. Because now I understand that there's a relationship between this and my book of Psalms that I've been going through and studying. When we get to Psalms 120 to 134, we're going to be, we're going to be looking at the songs of ascent or the songs of rising up. Now, when, when David was, was um, about the process of the temple as much as he could, he was looking for a drain system to get the blood and the, and the sacrifices off the temple mount as well as the wine oblations and some of those other things. And so he began to dig a trench off the mountain. And as he did, he tapped into a hole and the hole turned out that it went all the way into the Tahom, into the inner bowels of the earth and water began to flood out of that, that hole. And had he not stopped that hole up, the earth would have flooded again just as it did in the days of Noah. Because remember, in the days of Noah, the 40 days of rain didn't flood the earth. It was the water that came from beneath the earth. That's what flooded the ground. And so David had tapped into that water. And so David was searching for an answer. How am I going to deal with that water? And so he asked anybody, if I put the name of God, the yud ke vav ke onto a piece of clay tablet, and throw it into the hole, would I be desecrating God's name? Well, his answer came from a Hechtefeld, and he said no. And so David wrote on that, and he sent the water back down into the hole, 16,000 cubits. Now, the question is, why 16,000 cubits? Well, it, it's far enough down that it won't come back up, but it can be raised up. And each of the Psalms is worth a thousand cubits. Our gifts to God are worth ex a exponentially raises us up. And as Israel became closer to God, the water rose up into that hole that he had dug. And it rose as fast as they, as he, as they became good. As soon as they became bad, it dropped a thousand cubits. And so each and every time they began to think, and as Solomon began to teach, and as David was teaching, all of them began to raise the level of the people. They ascended. Now, when the temple was finally built, there were a section that went from the court of the women to the court, to the, to the inner court. And that court had 15 steps on it. And as the 15 steps speaks of the place where they would sing to God from, the Levites had their choir on these 15 steps. When they came to Jerusalem for the festivals, remember there were three festivals. If you lived in Israel, you had to attend one of three or all three, if possible, of these festivals. One was the first one was Pesach, the second was Shavuot, and the third was Sukkot. You had to come up. Well, as they would come up, Ezra had first time, as he was bringing the Jews back from Babylon, began to sing these psalms, these 15 psalms. And so these 15 songs became associated with ascending, drawing closer to God. When we offer an offering on the offering, on, the, on a sacrifice on the altar, it's called korban. It's the idea of korev, drawing near to God. And so this is all about drawing near, ascending, going up, rising up. And so that's what was happening as they brought these items.
but we have to notice the items. He starts with gold, but then he de diminishes the items. In other words, the value of the items decreases as you go along until you get to the last two items. And the last two items are jewels. But then we have to understand the story behind the story. First off, when it came time to giving the offerings, giving the gifts, the people brought the first 13. They continued to give gold. They continued to give all that they had in order to do this. The silver, the linen, all of the material necessary. Notice the material was mineral. The material was plant. And the material was animal. The three basics of creation, if we go back to that whole story, those were the things that God had made earlier. And now they were going back again into this new tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle itself then takes us back to the Garden of Eden. We are literally going back. Man is reaching the point we came close to, actually, the Jews came close to bring us to the world to come. It all came apart when they began to worship the golden calf. Just as it all came apart when Adam and Eve took the knowledge of the fruit. And so as our story goes on, we have all of these materials. But the last two materials on there came at the very end. You see the Nassim, the, the leaders, the elders of the, of the tribes were the ones who brought those items to the house. Now they didn't bring it right away. They weren't the first to give. They were the last ones to give. Everyone else had given, but them. Now, whether it's by guilt or whatever have you, they begin to bring them. There's another Midrashic story that says that they didn't even have to go looking for them. But when the manna fell by their homes, as they peeled through the, the manna, they found the jewels outside their doors. So God provided them with what they needed to give in order to complete the whole process. Rather strange story, but it's we have the choice of giving because we want to. There's a story of this um, Jewish man who asked, who wrote a letter to his son, and he told his son, he says, I have one final wish. And he said, well, what's the wish, dad? And he says, well, I want you to ask the funeral director to put my black socks on my feet and bury me with my black socks that I used to when I go to synagogue. And, and he said to his to the, this, he says, well, wait a second. He says, there's a prescribed outfit that you're supposed to wear. He says, I know, just ask him. And so he goes through the process of asking and, and the funeral director says, no, this is, this is the dress that you have. And so he wasn't allowed to bury him in his black socks. Well, after he got home, there was another letter that he was supposed to read to the family. And he opened up the letter, and as he pulled it out and he began to read it, it, he says, Dear son, I know that the funeral director told you, you I couldn't wear my black socks. But it just goes to show that you can't take anything with you, not even black socks. But you can take with you all that you learn in Torah, all of your mitzvot, all of your charity. All that can go with you, but my black socks couldn't go. So as we look at what these people were doing, they were giving of themselves as much as they could. And as we go through this whole story, you begin to see that there's a, a real pattern here. Now, the story doesn't really end at this point. In fact, this is the point of confusion in the story. Because you see at this particular point in time, verse eight begins by saying, they shall make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. Like everything that I show you, the form of the tabernacle and the form of all the vessels, and so shall you do. 
So he gives them the command. This is the second command. You remember the first command was the offering. Now the second command is, I want you to build me something. And this is where the disagreement comes from. You see, Rambam says that chronologically, this is what happens next. After the giving of the, of the uh, Mishpatim, after giving those, those commandments, now we go through the process of understanding this. And so Rambam wants to keep everything in order. Rashi, on the other hand, has no desire to keep it all in order. Why? Because in his mind, did they ever need a tabernacle? Which becomes another question, which Dave LeBlanc was arguing on last Wednesday night. Did they ever need a temple? And so Rashi begins the process of talking about this whole thing. And, he, and Rashi says that as, as you're going through this, the temple, the sanctuary, was not described to, to Moses until the second time down with the second set of commandments. That on the first trip up to the mountain, Moses received the 10, the decalog, the, 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 the coat, the, the, tablet, the tablets, and he received the oral understandings. He came down with those, and at the bottom, remember, that's when he ran into the problem of he stumbled, and his feet fell, and he broke the tablets on the ground as he fell because it was an accident. Not the fact that he was a little upset by the fact of what was going on at the bottom of the hill. After 40 days more of praying to God, beseeching God, at the second trip up the hill, he get, receives permission from God to come a third time in order to receive a second set of commandments. So he returns to the mountain, and on Yom Kippur, he will leave the mountain, not only with the second set of tablets, but he's also going to leave the mountain with the instructions for building the tabernacle. That's when Rashi says he received it, because otherwise, think about what's going to happen. I want you to make for me a sanctuary that I may dwell not among you, but in you. You see, the original language is in you, not among you. Today, we are probably living closer to what God wanted in the very first place. God living in us, not among us. I know we can go to church and I know we can go to a to to the synagogues and all of those other places. But the purpose of those places is not the same as what's going on within my own home. What my own home is about is daily, all the time. My study, my, my actions, my behavior for my, in front of my wife and my kids and all of the other things. That's what he was about. That's what God would have wanted originally. But remember the people were coming from what kind of a society? a very pagan society, a very idolatrous society. How did they come up with the idea of a golden calf? It was because of, but it wasn't just Egypt. The world was that way. Now, remember the Jews themselves were not all littered, learned, because as you go through this, you understand that they spent most of their time building buildings. They, they were cutting masons. They were building bricks. They were building buildings there was not the torah study among the people the people were basically good kind conscientious people but they were people without torah i still remember when i was in church and i was teaching and i had several people say well i only need to know what i need to know because the more i know the more i'm responsible for so if i don't know much then i'm not responsible for that and how many people had reached that point how many of the Jews were really only at the point of just getting started? Certainly they had 50 days in which they were now growing as they reached the mountain on the first occasion. God had been giving portions, been telling them things that they would need to know. And now finally here at the mountain, he gives them their low coat. He gives them the commandments and they, they come down with the commandments. He goes back up and we begin this process. So the story of the sanctuary is really the story of us. When we think about the materials that are being given, 
we give of our gold, of our silver, of our turquoise, of our, our, our substance. We, we oftentimes share clothing with other people. We, we give things. I still remember the fe fellow that was sitting in the church with not far from me when a newcomers came to the church and they sat in his chair. And I know some of you remember the story very well. He came in and he saw them sitting in his seat. He says, I paid for that seat. That's my seat. The people kindly got up and they left the church. And that was the last time they were there. The concept is, is the fact that, you know, we give, we don't take. Although we take that we might give. Remember over and over again, that story. We receive from God in order that we might give. That way our bucket is never completely filled. It's always partially filled. Room for more. Well, the story continues then. So he says, I, I want you to build me a tabernacle. Now, this tabernacle that I want you to build me has a lot of specifics to it, right? Now, I want you to think about this whole idea of specifics. Rabbi Schneerson, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, talked about the fact that in the very beginning, he had read three great Kabbalists who began to talk about the three three parts of the tabernacle, the unrefined, the refined, and the spiritual. You see, there's three parts to this. The first part, when we begin to talk about it, is the unrefined matter. That's, that's the gold, that's the silver, that's all of those things that are, they're animal, vegetable, they're, they're terrestrial things, they're things from this earth. The second level is called the, the, the refined matter. Now, the refined matter would go back to the days of the, of the manna. It would go back to things that are above our understanding or our pay grade, understanding the stars and all of the other things that go with it, the, the celestial. Then there's the spiritual things. Those are the things that are not seeable. Those are the angels. And those things, the miracles that are special, all of that would be included there. That's what's going on within, within the tabernacle. But it also deals with time because you see the, ta the tabernacle was about time. We would find today, six days are unrefined. Those are the days that we work. We do what we do. Then we have the refined day, which is Shabbat. Now, there are 52 of those during the course of a year or thereabouts, but there's also beyond that, the spiritual day called the Shabbat of Shabbats, Yom Kippur. Again, we go from unrefined to refined to above that. Same thing was happening within the, within the, ta ta the tabernacle itself. You had the unrefined. You had the Israelites who would come to the to the courtyard and and would walk amongst the people, bringing their offerings, offering prayers. They were the unrefined. Then you had the priests, the refined. They were able to go beyond the normal places. They could go into the holy place. Or you had the Kohen Gadol, who was the spiritually refined. Above all. Could, capable of going to places that nobody else could go to. Now, these three dimensions are the same things that we talk about when we, when we begin to look at what's going on inside this tabernacle. Instead of describing all of the property, the general global idea, the blueprint of the, of the court and everything else, God begins or Moses begins with the most intricate piece of equipment, and that's the equipment called the Ark of the Covenant. Well, wait a second. Is it the Ark of the Covenant or the Arks? Well, wait a second. Is it, is, well, let's go back and understand. First off, he goes through the description. The first thing he says, they shall make an Ark of Acacia wood. Now, the, there's no... Habrit, there's no, it's the ark. So there's this, a singular subject that's being described here. It's going to be two and a half cubits in length, 
a cubit and a half in width and a cubit and a half in height. And you shall cover it with gold from within and from without you shall cover it. And you shall make on it a gold crown all around. And you shall cast it with four rings of gold and place them on the four corners, two rings on the one side and two rings on the other side. And you shall make staves of acacia wood and cover them with gold and insert the staves in the rings on the sides of the ark with which to carry the ark. Now the ark is called an aron. aron. The root word is or, light. The ark was about light. You see, when it was in the inner court or in the Holy of Holies, it was the only piece of equipment in there. And it produced its own light. It itself goes back to creation. Go back to the very beginning. What's the first thing that God said was to be made? Light. So light comes from the very beginning. And this first thing that he talks about is this ark that's made with light. Well, it's made with gold and it's made with acacia wood. Gold. There's three boxes in one, really. There's an inner box that's all gold. And then there's the box that was acacia wood. And then there was a box that was gold on the outside. And then across the top of it, there was a, a seal that went around it that looked like a crown. And that was the top of it. You see, that alone, that's the Aron. That's the Ark. The stuff on top is not part of what I'm talking about. I'm only talking about the box. That's the important thing to understand. Now, the box was sometimes called the box of, of the testimony because we know that the Lukot, the, the tablets themselves were actually in there. And some people that question is, in fact, it's a discussion that they have. Were both sets of tablets in there? And the answer is maybe. You see, the first time Moses came down from the mount, the tablets were broken. What did he do with them? How did he care for them? Well, he put them in the, in the ark. He put them in the box. You see, Aron also speaks of a coffin. That's another way that we can look at this. It was the coffin in which he put the commandments. Now think about that for a second. The commandments are now put into the in, in pieces. They've crumbled. Look at the ark itself. Look at the measurements of the ark. Why does he have every measurement having a half? Why doesn't he make it fully? Why did why what's the half got to do with it? Why couldn't he make it two cubits? or three cubits, but he doesn't. He makes it one and a half or two and a half. You see, the, the half is talking about the brokenness of what's going on. You see, the ark itself contains the tablets, the Torah. Who is most concerned about the Torah? The studier, the one who wants to know. And as we look at the tablets, we're looking at broken pieces. And when God looks at us, in some sense, he looks at us as broken. And we should see ourselves that way because we don't have all that we want. My desire is to, to know the, the, the Torah inside and out, to be able to quote it, to be able to go here and go there and point it out. But that's the broken part of it. Notice it's three. Gold on the inside, gold on the outside, wood around it. Think about this. What you're like on the inside should be displayed on the outside. If you're gold in the center, you should be gold on the outside. And if you're gold on the outside, you should be gold in the center. How many of us display exactly what we want? And that's why sometimes I call myself broken, because I don't display in and out the way I want to. That's the idea. But the Aron is about my scholarship. It's about my study. It's about giving time to 
to this whole adventure. I never planned to teach on online. I, in fact, when I was 20 years old, I wasn't even planning on teaching Sunday school. But the people came and asked me to teach a, a Sunday school class, and that's how I got started. And then we transferred churches, and I thought, well, I'm off the hook now. I sat down three weeks, and I was already teaching an adult Sunday school class. Well, I got tired there, went to another church. What happens? I end up teaching again. You see, God has always known that my love is for teaching. But my real passion is for the Old Testament. You see, I love to understand all that God has given us and understand how to apply it to myself and to my life. So the Aron is given to us and it's a box, a coffin in which the tablets were. Now we know he goes up on the mountain a second time. It is at this point that some of the scholars say that he dragged the box up the mountain so that he could put the new tablets in with the old tablets and came down. There's others that say, no, he just got down the new tablets and there's actually two arcs. That the broken tablets, the first set, went before Israel into the wilderness. And in doing so, it flattened all of the ground so that the three million people could walk on flat ground. The second set of tablets stayed with the people themselves. And it was what was taught as they went. And so as they moved, the boxes or box moved with them. That was what was going on at this particular point in time. So it is, it is moving through there. Now, the next thing that it says is that as you go look, he it says it's got a cover, a caparet. So it's an Aron. And it's a caparet. It's two pieces of furniture, not a singular piece of furniture. Because the caparet is entirely different. If we look at the, the parts, and you, you've seen the pictures of a caparet, you know what it looks like. That it's a, again, it's a gold box, or a box top, I should say, that neatly fits into or on top of the Aron. And on top of this, is one solid block of gold. You see the two corvin, the two cherubs, were actually carved by Batzalel probably, and he carved them out and the two cherubs sit on top. Now this seems to be a concession to idolatry. And I say that by the fact that there is no place in Judaism where a image actually exists. You can't find it anywhere. And the idea is the fact that there, you shall have no other gods before me. But this is different because of where it's located and its function. It was not designed so that the two corvim that sit on top of it were there for decorative purposes, although they did decorate the top. Because it says that they sat there and by the time you take a look at this and you go back to the book of, of Kings and they give you the measurements for the Holy of Holies, you find out that the, the Aron and its lid are too wide and too tall for the Holy of Holies. Literally, the wings should have lifted the roof off of the Holy of Holies because they were spread out and open. Now, mostly we see him always hanging over the top of the caparet, over the top of the, of the seat. But the directions say that they were opened above. The head of the, of the uh, corvine looked at each other, faced one another. But in facing one another, they did not face each other, but face down. They looked at the seat. There's, it's about modesty. Have you ever noticed the, the uh, Jews who are going to Orthodox, who go to church, church, go to synagogue, davening, head down. In other words, the concept is they focus on what's before them, not who's before them, but what is before them. And so the two Korvim are sitting there 
facing down. Now, nobody knows exactly what their faces look like. Rambam tells you that the faces were childlike. Rashi will tell you the faces were angelic. You get your choice. The idea of being childlike speaks of a father and his love for his kids. That's what this whole thing is about. This arc is about love, the love of God for his children. That's what it is supposed to be teaching us as we go through this. But more than that, this whole thing, again, is to bring us to God. Now, according to the stories, again, when Israel was doing well, the two cherubims faced one another. When Israel began to slip, the two cherubim turned away from each other. Now remember, this is one solid block of gold. There is no spindle on these things, but yet the story is that they, again, turned away from one another when Israel was doing poorly. When Israel was being attacked, according to one Midrash that says that the Korvim covered the ark, literally protected it from what was going on. Now, Josiah, according to the other stories, Josiah was the king who took the ark out of the Holy of Holies and he placed it somewhere. Stories. Some sell us in the book of Maccabees that Jeremiah took the ark and all of the furnishings and took them out into the desert, out into the Qumran area, where he buried them in a cave along with the tabernacle. Because you see, the tabernacle was never destroyed. The tabernacle just simply no longer was used. When the temple began, to, was temple was built, this tent was stored, and now it was taken out. The second story is that Josiah understood that when Solomon built the temple, he established mazes of rooms below the Temple Mount itself. Those mazes of rooms then led back to being directly beneath the Holy of Holies, and that is where the Ark supposedly is at now there was a second arc that's been mentioned in ethiopia that arc according to legends the queen of sheba when she left she had married solomon for a period of time and she and her son when they left to go back to ethiopia solomon carved for them or had carved for them a a arc a chest that they took with them back and it's now sitting in ethiopia you can have all kinds of stories, but the understanding is of the fact that the ark has disappeared at this point in time. There's no ark, there's no temple, but yet does that mean we should quit studying and serving God? The answer is no. That whether there would have been a sanctuary in the first place or not, we should always learn about God. We should always strive to do our best, to be with him, to understand him. To know what's going on so the the story then begins to to unfold that these corvim that are sitting on top of the ark are there but in between is what's called a caparet a seat this is where god has said he comes to sit understand that that, that god has multiple facets in Jewish understanding, what descended into the ark itself and sits upon the ark is called the Shekinah, the brightness of God. Why? Because of the fact that we're talking about light, or own, or that's what's going on. When the ark was built, I need to give you some more backstories. We go back to the to the beginning of creation. God was walking in the garden with them. 
that's the words were given. But the understanding is that he was with them. The fact that they ate from the tree separated them from God. Over time, we watched how each generation was separating itself from God. And eventually they re reached a distance of seven generations away from God. That would be counting the flood. That would be counting Sodom and Gomorrah. That'd be counting the Tower of Babel. All of those things were separating God from mankind. It wasn't until Avraham began to teach the world once again about the one true God, that God began to move closer to this earth in the form of the Shekinah. It went from Abraham to Isaac, to Jacob, to his sons, to Amram, Moses' father, from there to Moses. And now here at Sinai, God is once again with the people. He has returned. Does he stay? Well, we know the book of Exodus or Ezekiel tells us that no, the Shekinah will leave the mountain and leave all together. Isaiah talks about it as this train filled the temple. His feet were there, but the rest of him was already exited. Some will identify the cherub or the, the ark as the chariot of God that's found in Ezekiel, the first chapter. There's lots of stories that I could give you about that. But the understanding is, is the fact that God has again left. It's up to us to bring God closer. How do we do that? Through study, through mitzvahs, through charity. All of that is part of our responsibility. And that's why he begins our story talking about the rudiments of what we need to do to give.